Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Glenn Kaiser. I'm the director of the Dolby Institute, and this podcast is a co-production of the Dolby Institute and the Soundworks Collection. This is another in our special uh, edition of conversations with the sound nominees for the Academy Awards this year. And today's conversation is with the team that is nominated for the Best Sound Mixing Oscar for A Star Is Born. Enjoy the conversation. So, but this is the this is the way the film starts. Like, bam, you're into it. This is a concert film. This is a music driven experience. So, I wanted to start uh, with Steve. Um, so, I, I know that you had some very specific challenges uh, because it was a lot. You know, it was very important um, to Lady Gaga, especially that the singing be done live. So, can you talk a little bit about, you know, how the how the music tracks were recorded for the film. Well, yeah, so I think at the beginning of the conversation, it was uh, Lady Gaga was going to do this live because she does everything live. The Super Bowl halftime show she did was live, and her concerts are live. She just doesn't lip sync. She wants to give the performance, and I think going into a, fil- uh, a feature film where she's going to be singing, she wanted to do it live, and she challenged Bradley to do the same thing. And uh, and How did Bradley feel about that? Uh, you'd have to ask him, but I, I know that he, I mean, as any of us would be nervous, you know, to sing side by side with Lady Gaga and never having sung before, um, that could be a big fail or I mean, it could be a big success. I mean, know? he's handsome, but that only gets you so far, right? right? Uh, yeah, it gets you, it gets you 50% there. But, um, so this, this part of the, the movie, which was the opening, not the originally scripted opening, uh, we shot in between sets at Stagecoach. So when they're switching out bands um, at a concert that you pay for, there's about 15 to 20 minutes where they switch all the equipment and all the musicians. And and we got eight minutes of that 15 minutes before Willie Nelson went on. And so Nick and I and my wife actually went to the the concert. It was on a weekend, and it was a skeleton crew that day. And so we kind of waited for one set, rolled all of our equipment across, waited for that set to be done, and then patched into their mix mix console to pull his vocal mic back and as many of the the instruments that were up there uh, into our system. And then we fed their console music uh, for playback track that they would hear through the wedges and perform with. Um, But we also didn't amplify it for the crowd because there's 45,000 people there. And this is an original song for a movie that's going to come out a year and a half later. So, so I want to make sure you guys understand what he's what he's saying. So these are original songs written for the movie. You're shooting a year and a half or a year earlier at a public music festival with forty five thousand people. You don't want them recording on their cell phone cameras and putting this out there. Right. I mean, it would be the worst version of that song you would ever have heard. <laughs> so Bradley Cooper comes out, sings like his life depends on it. Yeah. And it's not going out to the audience. It's essentially an acoustic set <laughs> from Bradley. So and they so can't hear. Within, he, they can't hear what he's doing. Yeah, potentially the first row could hear just because it's just the sound of his voice. But beyond that, people got a little confused because they've been at a concert all day hearing the music. <laughs> but they were probably drunk and high, so it was all fine. Oh, they were great. They were having a good time. <laughs> they were tripping. It was great. It was right before Willie Nelson. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. So how did the crowd react to it? Uh, at first, they were pretty excited. Uh, the Bradley Cooper's out yeah, there. Yeah, Bradley Cooper's out there. He went out there and said, hey, guys, we're making a movie, you know, and stick with us. You're not going to hear much, but, you know, you know, if you like what you're seeing, you know, cheer for us. Thanks. All right. And then, and then we'd start the scene. The first time, they were kind of pumped into it. The second take, they were like, all right, bro, let's get to Willie Nelson. <laughs> yeah, so, but, I mean, you know, his enthusiasm playing those riffs and, and just, you know, kind of exuding how, you know, incredible it will eventually be, I think, got the crowd excited. That's that's such an amazing story. So you, um, the last time we talked, you were just coming off of La La Land, which was uh, also a a pretty extraordinary challenge from a production sound recordist standpoint. Even, you know, I remember talking with you about that extraordinary opening sequence on the freeway overpass and how you had, you know, had to do so much pre-production rigging to for because all that was live playback as well yeah well that was playback not live not live singing not live singing right so tell me a little bit about the conversations that you had with bradley and how you set this up because it was uh, you know as we say it was really important to uh, to capture the the vocal performances live well i think going into it it was kind of um you know talking about the different types 
uh, the different ways of accomplishing what we were trying to do, which was record everything live, make it sound authentic, but also protect the music, um, which we had a couple different ways of doing that, playing it low through the wedges at a public venue like that, uh, but when now, we're so for people who don't know, when you say through the wedges, that's the that's the monitors that are coming back at the performers. Right. So the performers can hear the music low, uh, or, or a lot of time they're hearing it quite loud. But um, it's they're very directional, so the audience isn't hearing that; they're hearing the front of house that's playing back everything mixed down how they want it. So the guitarist stands in front of his, and he gets a specific mix of what he wants to hear. Um, so there was that version. We also had earwigs, earpieces, so that the band could hear the music and play along to it, and they could sing live. Uh, also not amplified, but that was more in the sensitive zones where we might have a bunch of extras or a bunch of public that we really didn't want anybody to hear anything because that would be you know, Lady Gaga songs, which were more sought after um, you know, for leaks and things like that. So we just discussed the the various different ways to get it. And then also when you have that kind of clean onset recording where it's, it's not going to sound like the venue, how do we make that sound like it's a, a rock show that was amplified to 40,000 people? Uh, so we went into that and that's, that's Nick came up with the system on La La Land, which was um, uh, recording uh, yeah, so we did impulse responses at every venue, which I think was a big part of getting it to feel live and being able to place elements in that space afterwards as well. Um, so what does that mean? Can you walk us through what are we doing impulse responses. So it's essentially taking a snapshot of the environment we're in. So we blast a, a tone sweep, frequency sweep, as loud as we can, and we record it back through a bunch of mics, 5-1, actually 7-1 on some of them, mics on stage, and then mics really far away and we capture that picture of what the tone sounds like blasting through the venue, and from that you can map essentially what the venue sounds like later. And I can send a snare drum to it, and it sounds like a snare drum was hit in the venue, and if we need to you know, send a guitar to that, it'll feel like you're on stage. So we did that in every venue we were at throughout. And um, yeah, we did it on La La Land too. Yeah, so and when, when we were at um, Coachella and we did that for the first time, hmm. you know, they ran it through their system, and it starts at a low frequency and goes all the way up. And the whole That's stage starts epic. shaking because <laughs> they have an amazing sound system there. You know, we're used to putting it through one of our speakers and we put it through their system. And when they. And you did this before without the crowd there, right? Well, we, yeah. I mean, it's a very annoying sound at a certain point. <laughs> and uh, we let everybody know, cover your ears because this is going to get awful. And, but we need you to be quiet when we do it. And uh, you could hear the echo coming off the mountains, you know, miles away because it was such a loud, you know, impulse. Yeah, it's so unique. The, the Coachella main stage is probably one of my favorite ones that we captured just because, yeah, it was almost a, the, the delay was so extreme. It was a couple seconds later almost coming off of, who knows what it was coming off of. Um, just incredible. There's no way to really fake that afterwards. You have to capture it. Yeah, so we, we talked to Bradley early on and saying, look, here's a, there's going to be the scientific way to make this all sound live. And it was kind of like, okay. <laughs> you know, can you, you know, and we explained it to him, and then we basically did a test to to a, a show and tell at Warner Brothers at one of the stages, and just held a concert, had them sing live with music playback, and then music also live, and did a two two mixes to say here's the full live version, and here's the full live vocals with playback music version, and mixed it and said which one do you like better, and there was, you know, no difference. And I said okay, we get it. So, that's, yeah. so Dean, tell us a little bit about um, just the, the process of the of the mix. Were there temp mixes? Um, what was the, you know, was, how, I'm always curious to know, especially with a first time director, which Bradley is, it's his first film. Um, how did you approach working with him as a first timer? How involved was he, was he around for the pre-mixes? Uh, curious about that part of the process. Well, I think the, uh, the label first time director is not this man. He is, he's, he's a genius. He's unbelievable. And his, he's a student of film, A and B. He just, he's 110% into every aspect of the filmmaking process from production, from being hip to the impulse responses to exactly letting Alan Murray, the supervising sound editor, who we can't not talk about, uh, 
because of the collaboration between music and sound effects. Um, let Alan doing his thing, but also being super involved in how he wanted, because yes, we're in a concert in, in parts of this movie, but we're also trying to, it's a movie and you're telling a story. So the re, the re-recording aspect of it is you have to take what these guys passionately worked on and keep that integrity through the process of making the sound for the movie. And uh, he was, he's involved, you know, he's involved as much as he was in production on post. Uh, he wanted to hear the, the temp dubs, he was very involved, which I wasn't involved on temp dubs, I was on other projects. And, um, but to Tom Ozanich's credit, being the dialogue and the re-recording music mixer on it, taking what these guys have done and then mixing it for the movie and adding his verbs as well as incorporating the, the live verbs seamlessly is, uh, was with great care and effort. But Bradley was very concerned on how his character's voice sounded speaking voice because that's obviously if you've seen the movie that's a big part of this movie and um, he was he, that was a big challenge for us on and especially tom to make sure that what steve recorded and in production environment it's not always perfect so there are tools you have to use to clean it up but you can't you cannot mess with that character because that voice is the third character of the movie. So he's 100% involved. He let us do our thing when pre-mix, when pre-mixing and then finally in the reels. And then uh, he came in and we uh, did playbacks like normal and did our, you know, did what you do. But um, if, if we lost telling the story in the mix, during a playback, we stopped, discussed it as a crew. Why, why did we drift? Why did our minds wander? Why did, why aren't we engaged? And we figured out why, and then we went back and fixed it and kept going. It was a, a tremendous, thrilling process to be involved, and we all loved the, what we were doing and loved. And we were talking in the in, in the back room this uh, tonight today it came from the top down that that commitment to this project and uh, he was the leader of it he drove all of us to be committed to it and so the final mix was uh, you two and then Tom was mixing dialogue or how, how, what was the division on the final mix? Well Jason Reuter and Nick did a lot of work prior to getting to the getting to the stage. And then uh, I can't speak for what uh, Tom was handed, uh, but uh, Tom and uh, Nick was back working feverishly. And then Jason was working, Jason Reuter, and Jason was on stage with us and collaborated with Tom on, on the m music part of the mix. And I have to say with Jason Reuter, he was on set with us every day, kind of seeing the process that was being pulled in, you know, because that, movie we would deliver for the concert scenes we would deliver 61 tracks hmm. recorded on set and so he was there kind of supervising and watching and going oh okay this is what's going on in this so that once he got back into that editing room it wasn't like what is all this information yeah yeah you know, i so think that's a lot of what made it work on yeah. this one it's it's invaluable when you're on set throughout the entire process and we're collaborating on the recording and talking about what we can do to make the post experience easier and elevate what we do in the mix. And a lot of that starts, I mean, most of it starts on set with decisions that are made from the beginning. So when you're there throughout and you know little things that you got, little details that were captured and you can grab them and pull them into the mix, it's invaluable. Because a lot of times if you just start in post-production, you have no idea what was done. A lot of cool stuff could have been recorded and you don't even know it's there. And it gets lost. So being Especially there throughout. The 61 I know. Tracks body art, like yeah, and there might be just a couple things we keep. You know, maybe the bass was great from a live take, or um, <laughs> there was a guitar moment from set that 
you know, is awesome. We want to keep it or a piano that we know is there that we can go dig for in those tracks that could have gotten lost. And Bradley knew everything. <laughs> yeah. He knew every nuance from set that he that that thrilled him or captured him and what these guys uh, what these guys did on set for, and then when we got to the stage he was wait a minute what happened to this and let's get it back uh, I've heard Bradley talk about um, about how um, how important Dolby Atmos uh, was to the final mix of the film and the experience but what as you guys were going through and working with the music and mixing uh, tell tell me a little bit about uh, how you guys were using Atmos um, uh, for the music and for the for the effects for the for the film well that's probably more your world I actually delivered in um, in five one and seven one which is usually what you guys prefer on the stage because it gives you more freedom. Um, they can take a 5-1 and pan it in the surrounds if they want. I'll usually give some stems that could go on the ceiling, but it gives three recording mixers freedom to paint, to maybe keep it on the screen for some moments and then pull it off. So I'll usually deliver in, in either 5-1 or 7-1 with maybe some Atmos stereos. And then from there, you guys can take it. The, the, the final mix originally started out as a 7-1, and then we were going to up mix it to an Atmos. And uh, so we, we got through all the 7-1 and everybody was happy. And we started the, the process of taking the 7-1 and making it Atmos. We played back a reel for Bradley. He was just blown away by what, what Atmos can do for him in, in all aspects of the movie, from quiet scenes to obviously this concert stuff. So that now had become the Bible. So we remix basically the movie in Atmos and then downmixed it to the seven one. So what you hear on the seven one is actually the Atmos mix that had from the re-renders. But Atmos uh, is incredible for music. It really I think it's bigger for music than anything else. If this is a great film. You're right. Yeah. This is a, sorry for interrupting. No, no. This is a great film <laughs> to do that. And then not yeah. taking away anything else from anybody else's film. But most of the Atmos was always known for, you know, the action movies and all this. So to your... But it doesn't have to be used in a quirky way. I think that's where it lost its footing early on is people would pan stuff on the ceiling and it just it came across as campy and gimmicky. But the biggest advantages of it are all the surrounds are full frequency. So right away it's huge. And then you could pull the music just off the screen a little bit so that it feels like it's still on the screen, but it has its own speakers. So now it's not fighting with with crowd or dialogue in a way that it normally would. I also feel like yeah. it puts the the viewer, the audience in, the, you know, because the movie is shot from stage, as if you were part of the band, you know, and that, and I think that that process allows you to, you know, okay, we're closer to the drums or closer to the bass guitar, so we're going to hear that a little bit more. As opposed to just a flat music mix, it's more or less, okay, we're in this part of the stage and the sound reflects that. And I think the audience feels it, maybe doesn't know why it feels authentic and real, like they're at the concert on the stage with them, but I think that that process that you guys did by putting them, putting the audience member where the camera is uh, audibly, then I, I think that that's what really paid off on that Atmos. Well, let's take a look at the second clip, um, and this is uh, this is a little bit of a Lady Gaga performance, uh, but acoustically, it's about as different as you can get from the first piece that we saw. So, um, let's roll the second clip, please. <laughs> so, Steve, talk to us about um, what's the experience like of recording Lady Gaga a cappella in a parking lot. Well, it's. Uh... <laughs> The, the crazy thing is on that scene, we, would ha we had four microphones going, two booms, uh, two radio mics, because you know, he talks down a lot, so we boomed him from underneath to get his voice. And <coughs> she goes from you know, kind of a normal dialogue to really belting it out, and you know, the radio mic sounds great, we're in a wide, but for her singing, it needed to be, be boom. So it was kind of that transition between her radio mic for the dialogue Boom, boom for her for her belting out. And uh, yeah, you pretty much just have to, you know, your hand is on that gain knob because you just don't, you know, she's going to belt, she's going to talk and then belt it out. And so you really just like, whoosh, 
Okay, I hope I didn't mess that up. And, um, and you really don't want to be the guy that says, we need to do that again, because oh, uh, no, I, mean, I over-modulated on that. Yeah, no, that, luckily that never actually happened on the film. But uh, there was the moment right after that where she's sitting behind me and goes, hey, can I listen to that again? And I'm like, sure, and give her a pair of headphones, spinning through, and she's just listening to this. All right, that was great. And you're like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, now I can go home happy. <laughs> but no, she was, uh, you know, very, I mean, that, that's such a great scene, like that, that hooks that scene into the, into the movie, because at that point, he goes, okay, you're going to come and sing with me on the next, you know, the next night on the concert. And so that's really where that singing relationship. Yeah, if that out. scene doesn't work, the whole rest of the movie doesn't right. make any sense. Right. right. And also the next scene where she's singing, you know, Shallow, if it wasn't a killer song and a killer experience for the audience the audience would go what okay so she can sing you know it's like she sings okay so why would we believe that she could become the superstar she had to really those two scenes had to really out you know outshine your normal you know you found a girl that could sing in a parking lot <laughs> you know what i mean so if they didn't hold up then then why bring her on tour so those were the two important things to really get the audience to go, okay, I believe it, I buy it, I get it. Yeah. I, so in, in addition to all of the just incredibly difficult stuff that you had to, to deal with in terms of capturing the, the vocal performance, I mean, this was also, that's a very tough sequence just to record from a production dialogue standpoint because you're out there in a public space and there's nothing to hide behind, so. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, you know, on a film that doesn't have a ton of money, you don't shut down streets, you, you, don't, you don't have traffic rolling by. And, you know, it's a quiet, intimate scene in a parking lot. Uh, so you just, you, you do the best you can. Why? That's why we had four mics for two people. You know, you just want to make sure you're getting their performance in that moment. Um, so, yeah. And then, Dean, can you talk about, like, when you get a sequence like that onto the mixing stage at the final? Because it's got to be, you know, it's such an intimate moment. And yet, you know, I think for most of us who've worked in the sound business, you know that, you know, if it's a big effect sequence with lots of explosions and stuff, sometimes that's the easy stuff because you can hide all manner of sins <laughs> in a good loud explosion. Exactly. But you got nothing to hide behind there. Well, what's interesting about that uh, scene is we had to support what Steve recorded for left, center, right, and surround. And this was the, uh, Steve hit it on the mark. This scene was super important to Bradley. It it it. It's a driving spot for this film. So as the sound guys, we couldn't flood it up with traffic. And, but there's traffic in there. But it had to be the right sounding traffic. He was on this scene, and, and it was a tough scene to mix because at first we were filling it up like you would any other scene, and then it started to pare down. But then the sounds changed in, to get the right sounds, and you get those little car buys that go by and please tell me at some point you had a mournful train whistle in there at no mournful point. train whistle but what you did have which is one of my favorite parts of this scene are the wisps of wind that move her hair that that because we were so stealthy in the backgrounds and and su supporting what they were doing on screen they played but they play like they're supposed to play you're not because when sometimes when you're in scenes and you want to hear that you got to overplay it and then it doesn't feel right and but this this was one of my favorite scenes I mean overall because it's just really a special moment for him and and even the guy in the background eating the Cheetos and waiting for him to come you know it's just it's special thanks and that guy eating the Cheetos had a mic on the whole time so we got every crunch but I think at the end of the day we didn't uh, didn't play it. <laughs> It would have taken the scene in the wrong direction, really. It's yeah. been a choice. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm curious, uh, did Lady Gaga come in at all during the final mix process? Did she she, she came to on? the stage. She came to visit, and uh, she was really great. She was super. We all got Gaga hugs, <laughs> right? And, uh, yeah, very appreciative, and we showed her a sequence. But... This really the whole thing. The, the whole thing was just special. It was just a great, great experience, and we were talking about that in the green room. And just for all of us, it was 
hard work, a lot of a lot of hard work, but it was special. And everybody, as super as much of a superstar that these actors and are, they're really grounded and really dedicated to this movie. And, and they're inclusive. They make you feel like they want you there. You're there for a reason, and it's not just to make their movie. It's it's a whole family of people going to make a movie together and succeed together. And so that's that's how it was. You know, that's how everybody elevated their game, you know, because you can walk into a movie where the, the top isn't the greatest and not the nicest, and you're like, well, okay, I'll do the best I can for you. But this was the opposite, where they're just the nicest, you know, collaborative people that you just want to hit it out of the park for. Yeah, and I think on my side of things, the unique part of this project was how little interaction there was for me with them in post-production because we had everything. You know, normally there's so much re-recording to do on these musicals. Um, you know, you're trying to fix stuff that you didn't get on set or redo things for a variety of reasons. But on this, we had so much incredible material from set, just plenty of stuff to play with, to comp vocals, um, that, you know, there was nothing to re-record with either of them. We didn't re-record any of it. <laughs> That's amazing. And is there any sort of tr traditional score in the, in the film? I think there's one cue, and it's a drum cue. Um, and that's it. And that almost didn't make it in there either. There was almost no underscore, but that was a last minute addition, which I think helps a lot. It's it's right after um, the Grammys moment. It's just the infamous frenetic. Grammys moment. If you, you, <laughs> if you guys haven't seen the film, it's pretty spectacular. Um, so let's open up and take some audience questions uh, about Star is Born. All right, great. <laughs> right here. And, and we're bringing a microphone to you for the uh, podcast recording. Uh, were all the were all the instruments recorded live, or was it just the vocals? We did record. We had a mic on everything live, um, just in case something happened. And there were some sequences. Actually, this first sequence, I used the live drums because we didn't have time to mute them because uh, we had so little time. And as Steve was talking about, we literally ran out on stage and just went for it ten minutes. So the drums sounded great, and I used them because they, you know, they matched the audience mics and they had some cool reflections. There were a couple of guitars I used. We had really good pre-records heading in, um, you know. So it was, we were concentrating on getting clean vocals to start with, and then when we got music, when we were able to go live. Luckily, the band on screen is the band that played in the studio, so they knew all the songs. So if we needed to go live for a take, they were ready to go, and we we got some of that stuff. And then other takes were were muted. Uh, yeah, I thought I, I remember reading somewhere you guys were talking about, which I thought it was really interesting. You knew going in that you know if you're if you're shooting a scene an all day scene for eight hours with the band you know you wanted to get the live vocals but you knew that the band would not necessarily keep a steady tempo all day long so in most of the cases i, I think i've got this right the band is actually miming to the pre-record correct but the vocals are being recorded live right. the vocals were always live the band was occasionally live, but we know go, we knew going into it if we did both vocals and band live, when you got in the editing room, it would just be kind of a, a hot mess. Just even if because the off, tempos, just, the, the tempos just would gonna match. They're going to be off no matter what. No, no matter how great they are, that's why you go see a live band, you know, because it's a different sounding song than you've heard on the CD. So that that to do that to a musician for eight hours straight and, exa and hope that they're perfect is just not wasn't feasible. But they were definitely capable of going live when we wanted them to, which was yeah. invaluable. There were some, you know, some scenes where we just decided to just go for it because it made sense. Yeah, and, I mean, there were scenes where they hadn't yeah. recorded the pre-record yet. Yeah. And let's just go, well, we know the song. Let's just roll with it once. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so we turn everything up, and here we go live. What I'm hearing is that you really had to stay on your toes. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. <laughs> yeah, that's But you, great. Pl you plan. You, you put the plan in place, and then you... You know, flip the also, switch when you need to. You know, a lot of times when you do a, a real show live recording, there's, you know, we might put some baffles in front of the drums, and this really wanted to feel like a gritty rock show. So um, if we let the drums be live the entire time, the vocal would have just had tons of hi hat on it. And sure. So, yeah. you know, got to set your priorities, I guess. <laughs> Other questions? Right. You. It sounds like you maybe already have answered this, but. Did the band rehearse and beforehand and when they did, did you guys kind of get levels so that, because you were going to have such a short window of time, say at that festival scene, you came on just in case you wanted to use any of it live 
it would it would do you know it would sound feasible and like a real band just as a rock musician i know how difficult it is to get good levels it's always dynamic sometimes they do it while you're playing the first song so did you guys like plan in advance this is where we're going to be when we come in so we can just plug in and do it not not level wise i mean we had a general idea of what the level of drums would be what that would be the the benefit that we had is that we knew we weren't that wasn't the final mix or the sound so as long as we're getting good clean levels later on these guys would you know take it and just fix it all up you know we didn't put any eq you know we didn't do any eq on it we record everything flat so they could start baseline and and kind of put the the juice on it yeah we didn't, we didn't have time for that sequence at all to do monitoring i assume and then you, you literally had it we were out there for ten minutes. Yeah, and, and then the and song, then I, and we played the song twice. And and then I heard <laughs> tell the story about Glastonbury because that was just unbelievable. Yeah, so Glastonbury is the the festival in England that's one hundred and ten thousand people there, and um, the three of us plus my wife we all flew over. Uh, it was Bradley, cinematographer, and myself flew over to jump in front of Chris Christopherson's set. And when we showed I, up, ironically, Chris yeah, Christopherson. Well, yeah. they, we got the permission to jump in front of him because of it. Yeah. Um, and we originally showed up with ten minutes to shoot, and we had three songs we wanted to do. Maybe it's time twice, and then Black Eyes, the opening of the song, once. And so that's your, you know, eight or nine minutes. Uh, and then forty seconds before we went on, they said, "Okay, you have thirty. You have three minutes. We're running low, or we're running long." So. You, we can't spare you the 10 minutes, you get three. And so the decision was made right then, okay, let's just play 30 seconds of each song of the part of the song we want in the film. And on the fly, we'll just play that and then repeat it and play it again and then switch to songs and, and do that. And so that was the thing we run up on next to the monitor board, give him a feed, take a feed of his microphone. At that time, it was just Bradley on stage, so there wasn't his band playing. Uh, and the first time, the first song, maybe it's time we played through the wedge just for him, low, not amplified to the crowd. Uh, we did it twice, and then the the uh, Black Eye song, which is the opening of the movie, has that great guitar riff. So we broke out the guitar riff and said, when the guitar riff goes up, just amplify that and play it to the crowd because he's going to be given this great performance playing a guitar, and in front of a four- hundred and forty thousand people, right, in, in front of a giant group of people that. And so that really pumped the crowd up because they could hear him, and then you know he's playing guitar, and and um, and in context of the movie or the music leaking, that's just a guitar riff. Essentially, it doesn't really give you anything. We still kept his vocals quiet, but uh, the audience reacted well, and then it was done. We ripped everything off and ran off stage. <laughs> Three minutes. That's yeah. amazing. Last question. So make it a great one. <laughs> no, no pressure. <laughs> so. Um, uh, Bradley Cooper's character, his his guitar sound seemed to be like such a distinct part of who he was, uh, especially like in a couple of those moments where you know, he was covering Roy Orbison, but he did it, you know, the Jackson main way. What was the the process and inspiration of coming up with that dimension of his character? Because it sounds like a lot of thought was put into his voice as well, and this was a huge part of him. Yeah, cool question. Um, well, a lot of it was uh, collaboration early on with with Lucas Nelson, who wrote a good amount of the songs and um, worked with with Gaga and, and Bradley early on in the studio. Um, so he played a lot of the guitar. I I actually did some of it as well in post, um, which was fun. But yeah, you know, it's it's a. Uh, it's interesting. I would say it's it's really pentatonic. It's rooted in the blues. It's not a lot of flashy chromatic movement. It's just kind of just gritty rock scales, pentatonic scales, um, and just a lot of ferocity behind the playing. Uh, you know, he he holds notes a lot and does vibrato to get an additional feedback on it, which is actually really hard to do. Um, to try to replay some of that was really difficult. Uh, so stuff like that, just you know, intense ferocious guitar playing, but not, you know, not too flashy either. It's just kind of bare bones, pentatonic stuff. Um, not too much jazz or chromatic movement, which I think fits his character. A fun story about that guitar is when, if you haven't seen the movie at some point, Gaga starts smashing up the, the hallway and the pictures. And we filmed the entire thing. And at the end, she grabs that guitar 
and is just about to swing it over her head. And the prop guy is standing next to me. He goes, this is the only guitar we have when we still have scenes with it. Please don't smash it. <laughs> and uh, she just grabs it and swings it and then stops and then just sits with it. And it was we just had no idea if that was going to survive that moment. <laughs> <laughs> and the prop guy is just, you know, having a, a fit next to me going, oh, <laughs> you know. But the, and you see it in the movie. The whole hall is destroyed and she's holding the guitar. So it survived, and then we continued to film. <laughs> and turned out to be a lovely emotional moment. Yeah, a yeah. very good one. Uh, well, that's all the time we have. Uh, I want to thank Steve and Dean and Nick for coming out and talking to us about A Star is Born. <laughs> so that was our conversation with the team from A Star is Born, nominated for the Academy Award for Best Sound Mixing. Thanks for tuning in.